Okay, so the final really big topic, or, or, or I'll be actually the biggest topic, and I'll let you probably need to know kind of in, in the most detailed sort of as secure as possible, because it always comes up, is the historical interpretations topic. So obviously it's the compulsory question, you don't get any choice of question, they just give you one set of two, of two historical interpretations about an aspect of Thatcher, and you answer the question. Um, I'm not going to go. Just so this is a source. Yeah. But, that, but in terms of the source skill, it's radically different to the one that you get in, say, paper two, where you kind of actually have to like, analyze the source a little bit more. It's more specifically, I'm not going to go into, I'm not going to go into detail of what, of how you answer the questions, but as I said before, it's much more similar or to your coursework in terms of what you're doing. You're not, you're basically, you're, you're, you're picking out what are the main arguments in the two interpretations and then supporting or challenging them using your own knowledge. So very similar to what you're doing in the coursework, basically. Uh, but we'll come back to specifically how you answer them at a different time, or if we have the end of the interview, no, not yet. Uh, okay, so uh, there are four main topic areas um, in terms of that. So the question you'll get, it will be from one of these four areas. It will either be a question about the effects of our economic policies, um, or the second main topic area is the extent to which state intervention in the public sector were rolled back. That's a phrase that she herself uses. Um, there is the extent of social and political division in Britain. And lastly, there is the effect of Thatcher on politics and party development. Obviously, there is some overlap between each of these things. Um, but yeah, you will get, kind of, you get, you'll get a specific question about one of these four um, areas. And they, they often use very similar wording to that as well. Um, so the, the period that she put up, so she, Thatcher's in, in power from 1979 to 1990, and those 11 years are considered to be, by many, quite revolutionary years in terms of how they radically alter the shape of British society. Um, and so the debates in this topic, they will often come down to um, questions of how far um, she kind of creates change in British society related to these four things, um, how far it's actually other things which create those changes, if that change is slightly overstated, um, things like that. So for the, moment, for the most part, it tends to focus on how far she creates a change. Sometimes it kind of it kind of goes into how far those changes are positive or negative. For example, in the economy topic. Um, so before we go into the economy, just to kick off with a uh, brief background about uh, Margaret Thatcher herself, just to kind of give you a context of where she's coming from. So Margaret Thatcher takes over the Conservative Party in 1975 after she successfully challenges Edward Heath for the leadership of the party. Um, she's your sort of, she's kind of considered from sort of a, a lower middle class background. I think her father's a grocer. Um, I think she went to a grammar school when she was younger as well, in her education. Um, I think so, at least. Um, I don't know if she, she was young enough, old enough. Um, anyway, so she, she challenges Ted Heath for the leadership of the Conservative Party in 1975, and she becomes the leader of the party. Funnily enough, actually, if you go back to the time, most people thought she um, was quite. Like when, 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 they, when they elected, when the Conservatives elected as leader, leader of their party, the press thought, "Oh my God, what are the Conservatives doing? They have elected a right-wing nutter as their leader," because um, that was kind of the consensus of the day. And so, in terms of her economic, um, uh, sorry, in terms of um, her, her brief background, she was between 1970 and 1974 a cabinet minister in the Edward Heath government. In particular, um, I think her role was she was, I think, either school secretary or something for children. Either schools or children, one of the two. Um, that's where the whole milk snatcher thing comes in. She was in charge of, um, or she made the decision to um, get rid of free school milk for kids. Um, and, but crucially, being part of that Heath government, that was a government that was brought down by the National Union of Miners. If you've watched or sat on, on or revised your trade unions topic, you should be quite familiar with it. The National Union of Miners run riot during Ted Heath's time, and they basically bring down his government. Um, and so, Wilson comes in again. So Ted Heath loses the election to the, to the Labour Party, um, and mainly because the unions ran riot and the public basically lost faith in him. Uh, and so that those four years and seeing what happened to the country as the unions ran riot really had quite a lasting effect on her later ideas. And so it kind of helps to make it helps to kind of it makes a bit more sense about why she was so militantly opposed or so keen to curb the powers of trade unions. And so she was actually quite dismayed by Ted Heath's refusal to stick to the manifesto pledges when he came to power. So in 1970, Ted Heath comes to power promising to end large parts of the post-war consensus. He was going to kind of reduce state intervention. He wanted to curb the powers of the trade unions. 
Um, and Ted Heath basically bottles it and kind of, kind of turns back on his pledges. And she was infuriated by that and thought it was morally wrong for him to do that. Um, and so that again, that kind of gives you a bit of background about her ideology. So she, come, she becomes leader in 1975, and then on the backdrop of economic turmoil, she, she wins the 1979 election, and then she wins further elections in 1983 and 87 before being ousted by her party in 1990. So Thatcher wins three elections, basically. In terms of the majority, the 83 elections, when her majority reaches its highest level, it drops a little bit in 87, and then she, the party stabs her in the back in 1990. Um, So in terms of her beliefs, very briefly, and again, some of these things will start, will, will, will be recurring over the course of this topic. Um, oh, before you even look into the specific policy she wanted, she's somebody who really what defines her is this idea of conviction politics. Well, she's a conviction politician. So a lot of the, so she kind of rejected the idea of consensus politics. Um, this idea, that, you know, she sort of seek to compromise with other ideas and sort of abide by this consensus. And actually, she believed that politicians should stick to their principles at all costs. Um, and that actually abandoning them because of, because of opposition was morally wrong. Um, and so a really common, common thread throughout her term, or her terms, are that she really will always stick to her principles and she's actually opposed to abandoning them because essentially the going gets tough. Um, so that's why I put that quote up on the board by her on my wall where it says, um, you must fight, you may, have to bat you may have to fight a battle more than once to win it. So that I think for me kind of sums up her attitude, which is that, you know, if, if you do go opposition, you just carry on going until you, until you break it. Um, so she's very keen on kind of sticking to her principles and her, her, her ideological principles. And so she's seen as being ideological rather than pragmatic, aka adapting to situations as they come about. Um, the second thing, of course, is her economic outlook, or is her economic outlook. And there's a few things here. The, fir this, the, the, the first thing she's kind of opposed to is welfare dependency instead of work. So she's opposed to this idea that people will live off the state and welfare benefits which the state hands out, as opposed to relying upon, uh, relying upon their own hard work. Um, similar, similarly to that, she's also kind of opposed to higher taxes. She wants lower taxes to be imposed on people so that people who do work hard can actually reap the rewards and the benefits of that hard work. Uh, similarly, and then likewise, if you do that, low taxes actually incentivize people to work harder because you're going to keep your wealth. So she's quite keen on low taxes as a motivator and a reward for hard work. Um, she also is quite keen on private enterprise, probably the most famous of her ideas is that private enterprise is superior, is naturally and inherently, it's naturally and inherently superior to public en enterprise. And the idea is because they have different aims. The, the aim of the public, or the private sector rather, is to make a profit. Therefore, they will cut costs where they need be and be as efficient as possible in the aim of generating the most amount, the, 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 the greatest amount of profit available. Whereas the government doesn't have that aim, and so you often, will often tolerate inefficiencies where perhaps they shouldn't. That's kind of the idea behind that. Um, she, of course, is quite a, a keen believer in law and order, and so she believes that people should obey the law, um, and that actually the law can only be changed democratically, so she's really opposed to this idea of people trying to change it through forceful protest. The fact that 10,000 people go on a protest and hate a policy is irrelevant. Things are changed through democratic elections and through the rule of law, um, so similarly, she's quite opposed to radical protest groups, which people often look less about because she's more focused on the unions, but she's also opposed to radical protest groups for those same reasons, but also with the unions. The unions do not have the right to force the government to back down. By what right can the unions claim to act? The unions, who elected them? Who chose them? She sees them as basically people who want to force their will on a democratically elected government, and so she has no intention of allowing unions to run riot and do as they please, because it's a, it's a democratic country and the law um, should be obeyed. So those are some of the key ideas. There are a few others, but we're not going to go into them, uh, but a lot of them will stem from the sort of basic ideas or principles. Um, so that takes us on to the first topic. So the first topic is the effect of Thatcher's economic policies. Um, so Thatcher argued the most radical approaches towards the economy. Um, the post-war consensus is supportive of state intervention in the economy, 
it supported, or, or parties supported nationalised industry, so large scale um, industries or lots of, industry, of industries that are nationalised after the war, the government takes them over, things like steel, the railways, electricity, gas, etc. Um, so, she's, uh, so, so she seeks to end that sort of large scale state intervention through things like that, as well as the free market. Additionally, again, the, the government has quite a significant role to play in terms of setting things like wages. Uh, so, they, they, so again, they, they kind of interfere in the functioning of the economy in a, in a range of different ways. And she wants to kind of end that and instead promote sort of a free market, private industries who kind of do as they please, independent of the government. And so basic ideas in terms of interpretations of her. So some historians would basically argue that her economic policies actually helped to reverse Britain's economic decline. Um, others would suggest that actually it did little to change Britain's long-term economic performance and kind of improve it. Um, and they, they kind of use some interesting numbers to show that. Then lastly, there's the idea that actually her policies are mostly negative, and those tend to focus on sort of the social impact of her policies, um, the way in which it sort of creates um, problems with British industry, and what leads on from that is just sort of unemployment and wealth inequality. So they'll argue actually no, her, her policies weren't successful because half the country, or large swathes of the country, did terribly and lost their jobs. So how can you say it's successful? Um, so the focus of people, to, people tend to argue that. If, if, if an argument is made that she did badly, it tends to focus on unemployment, things like that. If they want to say she did well, it tends to focus on um, some sort of indicators of the economy doing better, like overall. Okay, so I'll leave it for a warning, because it will start off quite in, in a quite an intense fashion. Like the actual main course, the economic um, aspect of Thatcher's government is the most confusing part. There are a couple of top, there are a couple of things in particular which I think are a bit confusing. If you find some of it not so clear in terms of the concepts, unlike the main course, you don't have to know everything in masses of detail because you normally really only need a couple of points to help back up an extract. So if there are some parts you're a bit unsure about, it's not a huge problem, so don't worry too much. Um, okay, so Thatcher's first term in office is kind of defined by this introduction or obsession with another kind of policy known as monetarism, or policy which are referred to as monetarist policies. So I'm going to try and explain monetarism in a really basic way, because it can, like a lot of these things, can get really confusing if you go into it in too much detail. All you need to know for our own course's um, benefit is monetarism as a theory, it seeks or it views inflation, okay, inflation being the increase in price of goods. Monetarism or monetarist thinkers view inflation as one of the most significant issues in the economy. That is a priority which the government has to target. And that actually, the government should therefore prioritise reducing inflation wherever possible, because inflation is a serious problem. And so, that can often involve things like uh, raising interest rates. We've talked about it beforehand, where if you raise interest rates, it makes it harder to borrow money, therefore there's less money to spend. If you're spending less, inflation tends to go down. So, and so they, they, tend, they tend to involve policies that help try to reduce spending, um, or the amount of money which is flowing in the economy. So raising interest rates helps to do that. It involves things like uh, higher indirect taxes. When we say indirect taxes, it's basically not a tax which the government takes directly from your wealth. So when you pay income tax, it comes from your pay packet. Indirect taxes are things that you kind of, you're taxed on, but you don't feel it directly. Best example of that indirect tax is VAT. You don't directly pay VAT. In the sense that you don't, it's not like America where you go and add it onto the, onto the bill. It's already implemented onto it, so you actually notice it. So VAT is your classic example of indirect tax. So like when you buy sweets. You're right, exactly. You're paying tax on that. But how many kids go to the shop and think, oh gosh, I'm paying tax on my sweets? You don't. Actually, maybe sweets are... There are some things that don't pay VAT. I don't know if sweets are. Like cigarettes. Um, cigarettes, definitely. As well as actually, we'll come into the cigarette example in a moment. Um, and so, despite opposition within even her... So there's actually widespread opposition towards her policies. Um, there's opposition from academics who sign letters to try and make her back off. Even her own party, within her own cabinet, there is widespread opposition to her monetarist policies, and they try to pressure her to back down. But Thatcher basically presses on and refuses to abandon monetarism. Um, and so the classic example of her monetarist policies is in the 1981 budget. So for those of you who don't do politics, 
The government makes a budget every single year where they basically outline what they're going to be spending, what their policy is going to look like. So the government has the annual budget. And so the 1981 budget normally comes in the, in the spring, around right, April time. The 81 budget came in the middle of an economic recession. So again, for those who are in economics, basic, ex basic uh, explanation of a recession. a recession. A recession is when the economy is shrinking. So if you, if you want, naturally you want economic growth, the recession is when the economy starts to shrink. So, um, the, so for example, the depression was a recession, a very long one and a very deep one. Um, so the 1981 budget was actually during a recession that, that was in the early 80s. And conventional wisdom up until then, in the post-war consensus, was if the economy was struggling... Oops. Um, if the economy was struggling, the government would basically try to stimulate it by spending, I'm um, sorry, would try, to, would try to solve it by trying to stimulate spending and trying to cut taxes. So they would, they would promote policies which would make people spend money more and sort of cut taxes. Because if you spend money, it tends to lead to growth in the economy. So you want, money, you want people to be spending their money, basically. If people don't spend, that makes things worse. Yes? Isn't that the opposite of what? Right, so she doesn't do this basically. So what I'm saying is, people wanted her to do this, and people were trying to pressure her to basically try and spend money to stimulate the economy, and she basically outright refused. And so her 81 budget did the exact opposite, uh, and instead she cut public spending, the government's expenditure by two billion pounds, and she introduces some indirect taxes to try and again reduce spending to kind of bring down inflation. So the classic example of one of the, one of the changes um, is the most extreme example in terms, of, in terms of price increase. The pack of cigarettes goes up from 14 pence to 80 pence. A pack of 20 cigarettes. So that's a massive increase. Um, is that what it's expensive now? Like, do you think that's the reason why it's, you know, it's carried on? Mm, I don't think that's a specific reason why. They've always taxed it quite highly. But yeah, they, 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 so, they, so, they, so they significantly hike taxes on certain goods, for example, like cigarettes. How much is 80 pence then? Still a sizable amount. Um, it's, that's, that would have got by, the, by, the, by, the, by those day standards. Um, so she brings in these policies to basically, or monetary, monetary policies to try and bring down spending and rein in inflation. So here's the important bit. The important bit. The sorry, go on. The 1981 budget was in the middle of a recession. What? So we said a recession is when the economy is shrinking. No, but what's the 1981 budget? So the budget is the government every year makes an annual budget of here's what I'm going to do, here's what we're going to be spending on this year. So it's an announcement of the government's spending for the coming year. Okay. Um, and obviously you immediately see within the budget, is the budget running according to within its means or is it actually going to spend excess, like is it, is, is it a um, deficit or is it spending more than actually taking in? So those kind of things to look out for in the budget. Um, so, the, yeah, in terms of the effects, this is the important part. The important part is, you'll get questions about, did it work? Or what were the effects of her monetarist policies? And so, here's the important bit, if that, the rest of that part is a bit un, 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 unclear. Here's the really important bit. The really strong argument in favour of her policy working is that it did bring down inflation, arguably. So inflation peaks at over 20% in May 1980. That's an astronomical figure. 20% inflation is crazy. Um, by December 1982, so within about a year and a half of her budget, inflation had dropped back down to 5%. And so inflation was definitely brought brain back in quite significantly. Additionally, again, the claim being that... Um, you want to, when, when there's a recession, you want to spend more. Um, the economy exits recession by the end of the year. So in that same budget year, so the budget will run from like, I think probably April 81 to the April the following year, <coughs> I think, and this has changed slightly since then. Um, and so by the end of the year, the economy had actually exited recession. But what we mean by, what we mean by exit recession is the economy has started to grow once again. The economy was growing by the end of 81. So there's no good actually her budget and her policy did work to an extent, yeah. Yeah, so, so did, the, the, did the monetarism work then, yeah? Well, you could use, so okay, what I'm going to say with this topic, like, what, what, what the claims we're making are kind of simplistic. Like, we don't, we're not economic experts, and so there, there, there are like massive debates about how far you can actually attribute it to that. But yeah, you can use that as an example to say, 
monetarism worked. It definitely brought down inflation and it helped to grow the economy. I'm sure there's an economist out there who would see that and just like tear his hair out and go, that's absolute nonsense. But for the sake of a history course, that's good enough for whoever's reading it, trust me. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's the argument in favour. It, it, it brought down inflation and it ended the recession. On the flip side, though, and here's what I said to you beforehand, the, the arguments that are often given, there's no argument the actual cost of those policies was severe for a range of people. So prioritising inflation instead of um, investment and things like that, it meant that unemployment increased massively. So in this period, it increased by a million as, um, due to her policies. Uh, manufacturing output, so in other words, the total output of manufactured goods by British industry, fell by 25%. Okay? And so it's actually so it actually harms Britain's industrial output, um, which is which is an aspect of the economy. And then lastly, it also had an unequal effect on parts of the society and led to greater inequality. The reason being her tax policies actually help the rich and hurt the poor. And this is really important just to explain how that works. Um, I didn't mention it, but I'll just mention it very briefly briefly. Thatcher actually slightly cut income tax, but she raised VAT. VAT as a tax disproportionately affects poorer people because obviously you all pay the exact same rate of VAT. Income tax is obviously different, so if you cut income tax, that tends to help richer people because they pay more in income tax. If you increase VAT, it hurts poorer people because you're all paying the exact same rate. So if you're rich or poor, you're both paying, what was it, 84 pence for a pack of cigarettes or 80 pence. So obviously that affects somebody more if they're poorer. So those policies arguably help to create more inequality in terms of more, more wealth inequality. Um, additionally, you can't necessarily, this, this is the other, this is kind of to counter the argument that, that you said by when, when I mentioned it. This is where things get a tiny bit confusing. Um, you can't necessarily attribute those successes to her monetarist policies. An easy way to argue that, because without going into economic theory, there's actually a very basic way to argue it, is that actually, despite her reputation, she didn't actually apply those policies consistently the whole way through. She did actually, at times, um, back sort of um, go um, implement, implement policies that weren't monetarist at all. An example of this, best example of this, um, there was a Labour appointed commission, so Labour were in charge in 1979, Labour appoints a commission which looks into wage increases, and that commission, I think in 1980 or 81, recommended that public sector workers get a 25% pay rise. That pay rise was above inflation, okay? Um, sorry, yeah, sorry, no, 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 pay rise, yes, they, they recommend a 25% pay rise, and Thatcher basically accepts it. If you're giving public sector workers pay rises, that does not stop inflation. That makes it worse because they have more money to spend. Another example similar to that, there is a steel strike which goes on, and she actually helps. The way they end the steel strike is she agrees to give those workers, or well, those workers, they, they, agree, they allow them to have pay settlement that is above inflation. So again, you've got workers being given pay increases um, that actually help to cause inflation because, well, in theory should do because they don't want more to spend. So Thatcher's policies and monetary policies are trying to restrict how much money people have, okay, because that brings down inflation. But then at the same time, she's actually done things at times that have done the opposite. So she doesn't, so there are ways in which she doesn't actually pursue one of the monetary policies the entire way through. And if that's the case, you can argue it's then difficult to say that it's actually her policies that worked so well, because they weren't purely monetarist. I don't really understand what that last point means. I know you just explained it, but I... So very simply, she's claiming to try and reduce money being spent, yeah? Uh -huh. You do that things like raising interest rates. It means people have to can't borrow as much money. Indirect taxes. It means people got things... Um, cost a little bit more due to taxes, therefore they won't spend as much. But actually, at the same time, she's actually introduced policies or agreed to things that have resulted in people getting higher wages, which actually does the opposite or, or creates the opposite effect. Okay. So then how can, how can those, how can they be called successes, the pay rise in the public sector? Yeah, so the point, the point we're making here, the way it links is, we're saying, 
that you can't therefore say that monetarism was this great success because she didn't actually pursue monetarism the, the, the whole way through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's not the only thing she's doing. Therefore, you can't say it improved because of monetarism because she actually does other things as well. I won't worry too huge about how the, 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 the intricacies of that point. Um, it's a smaller point, to be honest, that you could use if you were stuck for something. Um, okay, so that's her first term in office, okay? Um, and that's what's dominated by. The really big stuff starts to happen in her second term. This is, this is all the, the, the yeah, this, this is the, these are the big changes. So, this is all that you should be all quite familiar with. Her most famous policy, her most significant policy, arguably, is that her second term, she begins to gradually privatize industry. So we said at the start, Thatcher was skeptical of state-run industry, okay? Um, and actually the truth is even worse than that, um, at the time, most nationalized industries or large numbers of nationalized industries were actually making losses year on year. If these industries are making losses, how are they not going bankrupt? The government steps in and gives them subsidies. If the, if the business makes a 500 million pound loss in the year, the government basically makes it up. And Thatcher is completely opposed to the government having to subsidize the losses of really poorly run industries, public sector industries. It's like, what, what is the point behind that? And so her first, kind of, before she starts privatizing wholesale, her first step is actually, if the industry is bad and failing, we will let them fail. Okay, if the industry is failing, they should be trying to make efficiency savings. That means basically cut jobs. Cut jobs, try to make the manufacturing processes better, etc. So one of the ways what she does is she tries to she tries to force businesses to become more efficient, um, public businesses. And the way she does that essentially uh, is through refusing to bail. So if you if you make a loss, she would refuse to give them any bailout money or subsidy money unless they could prove they were making steps to become more efficient. The best example of this is British Leyland, which is a car manufacturer. So the car manufacturer, British Leyland, constantly making losses, she only gives them a subsidy after they lay off thousands of workers. So proof that you're basically making, um, making efficiency savings is sacking workers. So she refuses to give them any money until they lay off workers, because that's proof they're trying to become more efficient. Um, and so what they would do is, she would basically would therefore set these industrial targets, um, or sorry, industries would basically be set targets to break even. Um, in other words, stop making money and eventually um, start to make profits. And so actually, as a result, government, you could argue this is actually a somewhat successful policy. Because it goes from a situation in 79, I believe, where the government on average every year is paying out over a billion pounds in subsidies to failing industries and by 1988 industries as a whole, public industries, are now making a profit collectively of 1.3 billion. So the policy does turn, turn things around from industries making losses and relying on subsidies to actually turning profits. Um, again, the way she does that is more questionable um, since it relies on job losses to help, to help achieve that. Um, that arguably causes other problems. Uh, job losses mean you have unemployment benefits. Um, but if you're just purely taking, looking at the numbers, which is what pro-Thatcherite writers, or sort of pro-Thatcher historians might argue, the numbers show she actually helped the economy, um, or helped those industries. The final stage of that then, of making companies more profitable, so, Getting rid of subsidies is just the first stage. This is the, more, the, the second stage, the most important stage, is actually selling them off to the private sector. Because nothing works better, according to Thatcher, than private sector competition or industry. Um, so, the final stage, so the more profitable, selling off to the private sector. As I mentioned beforehand, so her idea was well, the private sector would work better because they naturally are driven to make profits, therefore private sector companies and industries will always make efficiency savings where necessary because they have to. They're trying to make profits. They're not trying to um, just, they're not, they're, 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 they won't tolerate losses um, infinitely. So she, as a result, starts to uh, nationalize them. Additionally, as well, if you compare them to, to, to nationalized companies, they were really inefficient. So this next stock, I explain what it means basically. Nationalized companies 
uh, basically, or rather, the stat shows one quarter of British workers, aka the ones in nationalised industries, accounted for only 10% of GDP. Here's what we mean by that. So you've got the countries, the, the, to the total value of the economy, a quarter of the workers, of the workforce, are responsible for only 10% of the value of the economy. And so, um, or the size of the economy. So you've got a situation where they're actually not producing efficiently. They're actually in a very inefficient workers. Um, and so you've got, you've got these companies actually making losses. And so between 1982 and 1986, she embarks on a big privatisation campaign where she ends up selling off major industries like British Aerospace, she sells off Jaguar, the car company, British Gas, Brit Oil and BT, British Telecoms, all being privatised. Um, part of that, so, 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 so she successfully manages to privatise these companies. Um, part of that as well, she also tries to encourage, this is really important, she tries to encourage ordinary people to buy shares. This is the other argument, people, when people give the whole the, the pro privatization argument, they rely on this quite significantly. Um, a large part of it was a campaign to get ordinary people to buy shares. So the really famous example is British Gas. They had this really big campaign where they advertised everywhere. It was called the Tel Sid campaign, um, where it was to try and encourage people to purchase shares in British Gas. Normal so people. So Tel Sid was only for British Gas? Yeah. I think but you could buy shares in other companies as well. And I think the British Gas, like, the minimum level of shares you had to buy was set quite low. So you, anyone could basically buy some shares. You didn't have to have like a minimum of like, I, don't know, I, think, I think the minimum was like 150, 150 pounds is the minimum, which is not much. Um, and what's the benefit of that? You own shares. So I mean, what's the benefit of what, but why does she want to do that? So she, so this is, okay, this is important. For her, she really believes in individual freedom. And that basically means individuals having a stake in society and actually owning, when you own companies as well, or parts of a company, you suddenly have a stake in it and you're kind of more invested in its future. And she kind of sees it as, you know, a way for people to become more prosperous. She, you know, she wants more working class people to have avenues to become ultimately much more prosperous. Um, and she wants people to all be involved in popular capitalism. So she doesn't, she doesn't want argument, she doesn't want rich fat cats big businesses to benefit from privatisation, but they're going to buy the business. She wants normal people to benefit as well. So actually, those, um, I think I might mention it later. Yeah, I was going to say as well, yeah. The actual um, shares themselves are sold at below market rate. So you're buying the shares for like a, th like a third less of what they should be worth. And so again, these people, they can immediately make profits off of it, which she wants to happen. People made so then she made shares cheaper? How did she yeah, they, they, they sell, the, the, share, the shares are sold at one third below market rate. I think it's a third. Um, so they're cheaper than they should be as well. And so again, you're able to make very handsome profits off your shares if you bought them. Um, so it's basically to increase individual wealth. Yeah, essentially. What's exactly. The thing? For, people, for people who want the opportunity to improve their lot and, in, and you know, become wealthier as it were, this is what she wants to be she wants to have that chance. Mm -hmm. Argue, that's what she would argue. Um, so actually, so just to at the same point, the numbers in terms of if that's successful are there's two sides to the argument. So on the one hand, for example, the British gas sale is really successful. 4.6 million people bought shares in British gas. That's a huge number. And so if you take the privatization program as a whole, the percentage of the country actually own shares increases from 7% in 1979 to 25% by 1990. So a quarter of the public owns shares by 1990. So on the one hand, you can argue her program works, there's lots of people, lots of more people do buy the shares. Having said that, the actual distribution of that is very uneven. The reality is the sell-off helps, as you would expect, middle-class professionals. So the numbers show that, if you, that less than a tenth of unskilled males own shares compared to half of professional middle-class, uh, sorry, professional workers. So unskilled workers, less than 10% own shares. Professional workers, people who actually have like a professional skill, um, have 50% of their own shares. So there's clear-cut inequality in terms of who actually owns them. So again, the argument comes back to when it comes to criticizing her policies, there was, there was quite a significant inequality. Not everyone benefited. Um, 
the other argument in favour of it is the revenue tax revenues, or well, sorry, the revenues it brings in. So, so Thatcher wants that she cuts income taxes during her, 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 her period in office, and the way in which she funds that is by selling off companies. So actually, the government makes nineteen billion pounds from privatisations, uh, and that helps fund things like tax cuts. Um, the argument is that at what cost? It's a short-term sell-off of state assets, but that's one that's a small argument against it. Um, in terms of the long-term impact of her policy, so things that happen sort of more towards the 90s, because you can also go to the long-term impact, um, anything up to 97 is valid for this course, even though she ends in 1990, any effects in the 90s are valid points to be made. So if you look at the long-term impacts of this, there is a clear improvement in quality of services like telecoms. Okay? So before British telecoms gets privatised, you had to have some massive waiting list just to get a phone line, and it wasn't very good, basically. So the system was crap. Um, so in things like telecoms, it made a significant improvement. Um, but actually, in other sectors, um, so things like water, gas supplies, there's no real improvement. And actually, prices have just been hiked up consistently, in addition to there being no improvement. Um, and some post thatcher privatisations have been particularly bad. So um, things like British Rail, British Rail, as I'll go into um, at a later point, um, gets privatised under John Major after Margaret Thatcher. Uh, but that's a really terrible one. The service, it becomes increasingly poor. Um, the prices continue to increase. The government, and despite that, so it's actually British Rail, despite being privatised, the service remains quite bad. The prices continue to increase, and they still make losses. So the government actually pays out subsidies to the railways, despite the fact that it's actually privatised. So British Rail was a disaster, without any, without any, without any shadow of a doubt. Um, and other kind of similar schemes, so they have this thing called the PFI schemes. I'm going to, I'm going to go into them in more detail in the next slide. Um, but they're basically these schemes where public services get provided or are um, paid for by public, by private sector companies. Um, things like that though, again, that's created huge future debts to be paid off by the, by, 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 by the public sector. The best example being the NHS. So all these hospitals that you see, these brand new ones, they're paid for using private money, but they're all basically up to their necks in debt because they can't pay it off. Um, so that's the counter argument against it. Privatisation has worked. No, it hasn't worked um, for those reasons. Okay. Final set of policies we're going to go over. These, the, um, again, these might get a little bit confusing. We'll try and make them not confusing if we can. Um, so she introduces, or in, the, in her second term as well, she starts a process known as deregulation of the financial sector. Um, again, deregulation can be a really abstract one. In a nutshell, you are basically removing a range of financial rules and restrictions. That's a naturally vague definition because deregulation can mean a lot of different things. Any rules that restrict financial operations for banks, etc., stock market traders or stock, stock exchange, how they function and operate, if you remove rules, that's obviously deregulation. So regulations, rules surrounding how you operate in financial markets, if you cut them down, that's deregulation. So they're a bit specific, there are quite a few things she changes, but some slightly more, I suppose, straightforward ones. Um, she scraps floor trading in the stock markets. So if you've ever seen those like films or videos of like some stock exchange where you have people like shouting on the floor and like running across the place, that doesn't happen at another stock exchange. They scrapped that in the 80s. Instead, they moved towards computer-based um, stock markets. So if you ever do see it on the stock exchange, it's basically a bunch of people looking at a massive screen. Is that... And is doing that, everything electronically. Like, you get people on the phone and you're trying to convince them to buy things. Right, that's floor trading. Floor trading, you will literally be trading in person, so actually kind of hanging a little bit more. It's like a marketplace. It's quite loud, it's quite noisy, it's quite a bit, it's a bit chaotic. I think the New York Stock Exchange still has aspects of floor trading, but in London, the London Stock Exchange, to my knowledge, has none. It's all electronic and computer based. Um, that's meant to kind of free up, make it a bit faster, allow it to kind of operate more efficiently. Um, 
Additionally, she relaxes the rules surrounding the foreign ownership of banks, so it becomes easier for foreign companies to basically take over and own British banks. That's again like another change that's going to help that take place. That um, yes, yeah, so that one. Another, another more straightforward to actually understand. Um, it becomes easier to lend money and also mortgages. So they, they so they relax rules surrounding consumer credit even further. But a bigger, a bigger policy change. So you might not have known there is historically a significant difference between banks and building societies. I don't even know what a building society is. Nationwide building society. I mean, national is a building society. What is that? So, okay, the current difference is very minimal now. But, but what you need to know is prior to this act being passed, to get a mortgage, you had to go to a building society. Only building societies like nationwide, I mean, national, what back then. Societies they give mortgages. They, they build, I, I think, okay, I'm not entirely sure myself. But one thing I do know, they, 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 they themselves solely provide. I think they would, I suppose, probably do some building, but they basically they would give people mortgages. Banks could not give mortgages. Um, additionally, there are also restrictions on what building societies could do that banks could do. Um, so one of the main changes that, the, that she makes is she allows banks to also lend mortgages. And so suddenly, it becomes much easier for people to get mortgages than they used to be. Um, so again, she's removing some regulations around financial transactions. Um, I'm not yet, so I'll, honestly, I won't go too much into what banks and building societies are, but just know that prior to this, to her deregulation, banks could not give mortgages. Only building societies could. Um, I'm not going to lie, I spent like 10 minutes trying to work out and research all the differences between banks and building societies, but it kind of confused me because I don't really use banks functions that much. Just a bunch of stuff I don't understand. Do you use a bank? Not for their more intricate functions. I, mean, I use it for one reason: put money in, it, take money out, nothing else. Anyway. Do you know I have a mortgage? Let's not go into that. The point is, the point is, I'm making is that it can confuse you a little bit. Most important thing is, banks could then lend mortgages. So what you get as a result um, is this allows the city of London to become a major financial world centre. However, it's at the cost. Um, of basically increase in debt. Very, very obvious and straightforward. If you allow people and banks to give out credit, like pretty casually, uh, then if you allow mortgages to increase significantly, household debt, private debt, etc., increases. And so actually, by the end of the century, if you combine British um, total debt, so if you combine private debts, private household debt and mortgages, um, British debt was the highest in Europe by the end of the by the end of the century. And so. Her deregulation arguably helped to transform the city of London into a major financial wealth centre. Well, on the flip side, though, it massively increased private and personal, private personal debts. Um, additionally, things were made worse, and in 87 there was a stock market crash. Um, so there was a stock market crash in, 1990, in 1987, um, and so I'm going to try and like, make this kind of clear. Um, Eventually, the government decides, so, that, so, so what happens is, you then have an, infla an inflation problem comes about. So um, the inflation problem, the government decides to solve it by raising interest. Um, because again, that's how you combat inflation, cutting spending. The trouble is though, if large swathes of the country have suddenly been taking out lots of debt, buying things on credit, taking out mortgages, etc. So that people are already in debt now. If you then raise interest rates, their debt becomes even worse. And so what this does is this makes the situation, well, the situation is made worse by the extent to which people in the country had taken out credit and been in debt on large swathes of people. And so by 1990, actually, another recession starts. Britain goes into recession again in 1990. And unemployment um, had massively increased as well. And so by the end of then that, by her last year in office, the economy is actually tanked. And her unpopularity starts to soar a little bit. And actually, when we look at her stab in the back, I'll talk about how one of the reasons why she got ousted by her own party is because the economy was doing quite badly. And um, people were starting to get unhappy. Um, last thing we'll mention about economic policies, and then we'll wrap that one up. Um, in terms of economic policies, overall, as you make, the first thing we're going to come back to is inflation. So, there's this claim that's often made 
that she lowered inflation. Okay, we talked about it already. The monetary policy is inflation comes down. However, um, this can easily be counteracted um, by comparing British inflation rates to the European average. So, the British, so even though inflation in Britain came down, it was actually still higher on average than, the European, than, than it was across Europe at the time, from, from 1979 to 1997. So inflation is coming down, but it's still higher than, than other countries. Therefore, it, therefore, there's clearly still an issue there. Um, additionally, the fact that inflation comes down, again, you can't necessarily attribute it to her policies. We mentioned one reason. Another reason is inflation is not always behind the country. It's not a case where the country had been suffering with, for, with high inflation for decades and decades, then she came along and solved it. Actually, there had been very there had been prolonged periods of low inflation throughout the previous decades when the government actually had very different current policies. So between 1954 and 69, when the government had more um, interventionist policies in the economy, inflation was still quite low. So again, you can't necessarily even attribute it to her policies. Um, and actually, rather, it's more, it's more of a general pattern. Inflation goes up and it goes down naturally. It wasn't really her policies which changed it. The second thing is economic growth, growth in the economy. Um, the economy does grow on the Thatcher, and it actually reaches, reaches a peak of 4% growth. However, um, if you again consider long-term trends, that puts it basically even with other long-term trends in the economy between 1960 and 97. So if you take her period in office, the growth in the economy isn't significantly higher or much different to how what it has been after she left office or even before she came in. So again, under different um, economic policies. And then last, lastly, final point at that point, this is, this is a more interesting one. Um, we have this, me this, this um, measure of um, this, this thing called GD GDP per capita. So GDP per capita is you take the, the, the total size of the economy and then you divide it by the number of people living in the country. So the GDP per capita of places like Qatar is literally insane because their economy is fairly large, but they have like a million people living there. And so per, per head in the country, they have a ridiculous GDP per capita, essentially. Uh, whereas a country like China has the second largest economy in the world, but with a billion people, therefore their GDP per capita is actually quite small because, right, you've got a big economy, but shed among an entire population of a billion, it's not much. So Britain's GDP per capita, in other words, how much money there is in the, in the economy per head, actually our ranking globally drops quite significantly um, in this period. So our, our GDP per capita compared to other countries actually goes down and, um, after that, during Thatcher's era, during Thatcher's period. Um, and then lastly, of course, the point you mentioned beforehand is the classic argument against her time in office is the unemployment point. Unemployment um, massively increased and is a huge legacy of her time in office. It reaches a 3.2 3 million peak, um, which is substantially higher than it ever was in the 50s, 60s and 70s. Um, similarly, workers themselves remain unproductive or less productive. So we talked about how there's this problem of um, lack of productivity of workers to have 25% of the workforce produces 10% of the GDP of the country of the economy's GDP. The, the workers remain less productive than competitor nations like the US, France, Japan and Germany. So again, when you take into account a global um, context, Britain's economic performance is not impressive at all in the 1980s and, 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 and following on in the 90s. Um, so we'll leave that one there in terms of her economic policies. Um, so if we then turn to the yeah, so if we then turn to the next um, major topic.